Let me read again the words of John chapter 1 and verse 14, where John in this magnificent prologue, introduction to his gospel, says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the rush and busyness of this season, it's quite right that we take the time today and uh, every Lord's Day, but particularly today, to think and to pause for a while and ask the question, what exactly does this verse mean when it says that the word became flesh? If I were to go around this room this evening and say to you, if you were to appear on a TV quiz show like Mastermind and have a specialist subject, and if your specialist subject was to be a famous person, a well-known celebrity, it might be that um, all of us could think of celebrities that we might answer questions on from the world of music, from the world of theatre, from the world of politics, from the world of sport. We could no doubt be experts on all sorts of different men and women, living and dead, who are famous in their different fields, and that's quite, quite right and quite good. However, if you're a Christian, your greatest interest and mine should be in the person of Jesus himself. Last Tuesday, the children sang a song, or were, or were going to sing a song anyway, What Do You Know About Christmas? And uh, let me change that slightly and knock off the mass at the end and say to you this evening, What do you know about Christ? What do you know about Jesus Christ? Who exactly is Jesus? Now, there are things that are part and parcel of general knowledge. People go on these TV quiz shows, and there are questions about Christianity and about the person of Jesus, which everybody seems to know, or most people know, perhaps less so than before. There are things about Jesus that we've learned from Sunday school and from, uh, from church maybe over many, many years. But how well do we really know who this man is? The author to the Hebrews says in various places, consider Jesus. Look at him carefully. Take time. View him closely. Who is this man? Or what exactly is this man? Who is this Jesus who calls himself the Son of Man and yet is also called the Son of God? God? Who is this Jesus who we say is God and yet also is man? Tell me, what does it mean? How can we explain that? If somebody stopped you and said to you, you're a Christian, aren't you? Can you tell me something that's always puzzled me? How is it that Jesus is God and man at the same time? Can you explain that to me? I wonder how confident would you be about explaining that to somebody who asked you that question? Wouldn't it be great if they did ask you that question? If they stopped you in the street and said, hello, I wonder if you could help me with a question. How is Jesus God and man? And we had the privilege of helping them to understand that. These are great and central questions. They're the greatest questions, really, that we can ask. I said this morning, the Bible tells us that we are united to Christ. We saw last Sunday morning that Jesus Christ is God's salvation. Therefore, we should have no excuse to fail to learn of who Jesus is, to know him as well as we can, to understand our Savior. There have been times when Ordinary men and women have been taken up with these questions. 
If you lived in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, in the fourth century, and you went to a barber's shop to get your hair cut, and you chatted to the barber, he wouldn't be talking about the football, he wouldn't be talking about the weather, he wouldn't be talking about Brexit. They'd probably instead be talking about who Jesus is. Is he homoousios or homoousios? You're scratching your heads now, aren't you? Is Jesus of the same substance as God the Father, or is he similar substance to God the Father? I jest not. These were the things that they were talking about in barber shops in Constantinople some 1,700 years ago. These are big, weighty questions. Let me begin. First point. Jesus is man. Jesus is human. The manhood of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, is taught everywhere in the Word of God, in the Gospels, in the New Testament. There's nothing in the New Testament that remotely compromises the understanding that Jesus was and is fully human. And to be honest, very, very few people today would doubt that. Of course Jesus was a man. There are very few today, really, who sensibly doubt that Jesus existed. He existed, and he existed as a real human person. And yet there were some folk around 3rd century, 2nd century, who said things like this. He wasn't really human. There was a group of false teachers called the Docetists, and they said this. They said, Jesus only appeared to be human. Why did they say that? Well, they said, our assumption is that anything that is physical, material, fleshly, is, is not holy. It's common. It's vulgar. It's second or third class. Uh, God didn't create matter. No, God is pure and spiritual and non-material. And therefore, if Jesus is God, he, he couldn't have been a material being. He only looked as if he were human. He appeared to be human. And we have to firmly and strongly resist any tendency like that. God created a material world. God said that this material world is good. The humanity of Jesus is good and right and noble. It's nothing to be embarrassed about, nothing to be awkward about. Jesus breathed, Jesus sweated, Jesus got tired, Jesus did all the bodily things that your body and mine do. He's human, as human as you and I, human. But the question is, why did questions of this kind arise in the first place? Well, because clearly Jesus is more than an ordinary man. His conception, as we've seen a few times, was unique. The words of the angel to Mary, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The power of the Most High it is he who will conceive this holy child in your womb. He will be called holy, the Son of God. Yes, a child will be conceived. A child will be born, a human child, every bit as human as we are. But this child is not only human. The second thing we see is that Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. And there's so much evidence in the New Testament to show us that. It's not just the explicit statements that we have, for example, in this passage before us now. First one, read it again. In the beginning was the Word. That's him, the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yes, that's right, but there's more than that. The actions of Jesus, the way Jesus was responded to by people. There are so many striking examples. 
Come with me to a boat on the Sea of Galilee, a boat that is being tossed and pitched and thrown around the sea by a violent storm. And the disciples are terrified. They think they're about to drown and lose their lives. The storm is so violent. And they, they wake up Jesus and say, Master, don't you care if we're drowning? And what does Jesus do? You know what he did. With a word, he calmed the storm. And immediately the sea and the waves were absolutely flat and still. And the disciples said to each other, in amazement and awe and fear, Who is this man? Who is this? That the wind and the waves obey him. It's a wonderful rhetorical question. Who alone can calm the wind and the waves and make them still? There's only one answer. And in the same way, the other passage which appears in all the first three Gospels, and another of many of such passages, the paralyzed man on his mat in that crowded house. And our Lord Jesus standing over him and saying to him, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and Pharisees murmuring and saying, Who is this? What is this man doing forgiving sins? No one can forgive sins but God alone. Absolutely right. Yes, that's the point. No one can forgive sins but God alone. And here is this Jesus forgiving the sins of this man put two and two together and get the right answer we see Jesus being worshipped for example by Thomas after the resurrection my Lord and my God does Jesus say oh, steady on Thomas don't go too far of course he doesn't my Lord and my God is appropriate worship for Jesus to receive and then another, even more amazing example that I always think of, and I try and bring this up with Jehovah's Witnesses and other people who, who, who dispute the, the divinity of Jesus. You come to Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, and what do you notice? You see that in chapter 4, God the Father, upon his throne, is given all glory and praise and worship by the four living creatures and the 24 elders. They're praising God Nothing controversial about praising God the Father, is there? And then what do you find in chapter 5? There is the Lamb that has been slain, but is alive, and that's obviously Jesus. And what happens to him? He receives glory and praise and worship that is no less intense and heavenly and divine than that which the Father has received. This Jesus is man and this Jesus is God. But let's try and answer our question. How can we put it all together? How can we really understand who Jesus is? Don't God and man mean two very different things? Can someone be God and be man at the same time? How is it possible and these are things we need to understand and to try and answer. After a number of centuries of debate and discussion, many of these issues came to a head, and they were settled in the year 451 AD in what's become known as the Chalcedonian Definition. Now, this isn't a lecture this evening, this is a sermon. Nevertheless, I want to look at this with you a little this evening, and at the end I'm going to leave some bits of paper for people to take away to, to look at to help if it does help. But I want to understand just how it is that Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, is God and is man. And these things that I'm about to share this evening are truths and teachings that have been shared and believed by every major branch of the Christian church for 1,600 years or nearly that. And what's the great point here? Jesus Christ is one person. Jesus Christ has two natures. This is not some minor detail. This is not some 
intellectual, academic-sounding matter that we don't need to be concerned about. This is the truth that God's people have believed and taught and proclaimed for centuries. So I come to my third point this evening. Jesus is both God and man. How? Well, this Chalcedonian definition speaks about Christ in two natures, the divine nature, the human nature. And those natures exist, and then they give four descriptions. Inconfusedly. That sounds confusing, doesn't it? It means without confusion. Unchangeably. Indivisibly. Inseparably. The Word became flesh. God the Son became man. He's been God from all eternity. He will never cease to be God. He never can cease to be God. God can't change to being not God. God is, and God is God forever. God is eternal and unchangeable. But we understand this. At a certain time in human history, at the very time when the angels spoke to Mary, then, at that conception, that Holy Spirit conception, the Son of God added humanity to his divinity. He who was divine from eternity then added humanity to that divinity. Let me spell this out. Let me spell out these four words. Christ is one person with two natures. And these two natures are present in him inconfusedly, without confusion. What does that mean? It means the divine and the human are not mixed together. They're not stirred together into a mixture. I can remember once a preacher saying this. He said, Jesus was a perfect blend of God and man. Now that's very misleading language. Because you will know if you do any cooking, that a blend is neither one thing nor the other. If you blend together eggs and milk... You don't have either eggs or milk. You have something resembling pancake mixture. If you add a bit of flour to it, I think, though I don't know, I think that's the case. But you haven't got eggs, you haven't got milk, you've got a third kind of substance. And this is the point. Jesus is not a blend, a mixture, a confusion of God and man. If he were, he would cease to be God or man. He'd be some third kind of being. And he isn't. He's God. And he becomes man. And he remains man forever. That's the first of these four words. Inconfusedly. It's really not all that confusing. It means he's not a mixture. Secondly. The two natures of Jesus. Human and divine are joined unchangeably. What does that mean? It means that he did not undergo a change of nature from being divine to being human. He didn't swap a nature for another nature. He didn't come into the world and before this he had been divine and then he came into the world and then he became human and his divinity became his humanity. That's not what happened. We need to be very clear about this. There's an idea taught by some based on Philippians 2. It says that Jesus made himself nothing and uh, he, he took on the form of a servant and they mean by that some people that he, he left his godness behind him. 
He stopped being God to become a man instead. Well, that is not what happened. If that were the case, how can he calm the wind and the waves? How can he be worshipped, my Lord and my God? He didn't leave his divinity behind. There's another idea from much longer ago that Jesus was born a man, and he was only a man until he was baptized, and then he became divine when the Holy Spirit came upon him. And again, that is not the case. The two natures were joined together at the very time when Jesus was conceived. His deity remained perfect, undisturbed, and to that perfect deity he added perfect humanity. And the perfect deity and the perfect humanity remain intact forever. Then there's a third thing we need to understand. The two natures of Christ exist indivisibly. What does that mean? Well, again, it's combating an ancient early church heresy. And the idea was taught a long time ago that Jesus, the Son of God, yes, he had a human body. He had a human nature as far as his physical nature was concerned, but but the mind of the Son of God, uh, the soul of the Son of God, was, was God. That was divine. You had, if you like, a human body with a divine mind inside. So you had somebody who had human parts and divine parts. Is that a problem? It is a problem. Do you and I have a human saviour? A high priest who sympathizes with us, who knows what it is to be tempted, to weep, to be weary, uh, to feel sad, to feel betrayed. All of these things we do, don't we? Therefore, he had to be made exactly like his brothers and sisters in every way, yet without sin. Which means this, the mind of Jesus is human as well as divine. And you say to me, I can't get my head around that. No, of course you can't. Neither can I. But we are seeking to be faithful to Scripture. Jesus Christ was not some kind of minotaur with the head of one being and the body of another. He wasn't a being made up of different parts, somehow joined together from, from different beings. He is fully God. He is fully man. His humanity is a full humanity, not a part humanity. His divinity is a full human divinity, not a partial divinity. Without division, indivisibly. And then the fourth one. The two natures of Christ are found in him inseparably. You can't prize apart the human and the divine. And the idea that was being rejected here, the error rejected here, was the idea that, that Christ had two different levels of self-consciousness. That he was almost two people, two persons, almost schizophrenic in some ways. That he had a divine self-consciousness and a different human self-consciousness. And against that we say no. The Bible says no. The Bible speaks of one Lord Jesus Christ. One person. One level of self-consciousness. He's not shifting back and forth from one nature to another like a ping pong ball being hit across a table tennis table. He is one individual with, with one self-conscious identity as Christ Jesus. Understand that. Without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. These are great and important lessons that we need to understand. You might ask me, why, why weary us this evening with 
this lesson? Well, I'll tell you why. It's when the church loses its grip upon these realities, these doctrines. It's when these start to be regarded as negotiable details that error can creep into the church of Jesus Christ and people can go astray. These are things we need to look into because they are essential to the faith we profess. However, it's also essential because only such a saviour can really save us. A saviour who is both divine and human. We need a man to save us. We need our elder brother to save us. We need somebody exactly like us to represent us before the Father in heaven. But we need one who is without sin. We need one who is almighty, who can destroy death, who can defeat Satan, who can bring us to the very presence of God. And only a divine Savior can do that. It is to God's glory. It is for our blessing and our salvation that we hold on to these things. The Word became flesh. He didn't cease to become the Word. He didn't cease to be the Word. He didn't merge the Word with the flesh. He wasn't part Word, part flesh. He wasn't Word and flesh in somehow differing places. No. The Word, the Son of God, became one of you, one of me, and remained that way, and remains that way, while remaining God. And that's how he saves us. And for all the celebrities and famous people and famous facts that you and I may know a great deal about, there's nothing better than this. You and I should understand who Jesus really, really is is. It's worth our time. It's worth our effort. And the ultimate end of this is that we should all honor the Son, even as we honor the Father. That we should worship Jesus as Lord, as Christ, as Savior. This is the Jesus revealed to us in the Scriptures. This is the Jesus who's come to save us. Praise be to his name. Let's pray together.